the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. As always, I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey, hey, guys. Hello. Hi. Listeners, great to be with you again this week. Last week, we spent some time talking about Moses, and we looked at how Second Temple literature emphasized Moses' prophetic authority, and specifically how the end of times was revealed to him. And we talked a little bit about how he was a precursor to the Messiah and uh, how passages like Deuteronomy 18 played into that. Uh, And so today we want to continue our discussion of Moses. We want to talk about Mount Sinai and things that happened at Mount Sinai, how Second Temple literature and uh, the New Testament speaks about those things and even projects Mount Sinai into the future. Yeah, because... uh because it it becomes a thing in uh, in Second Temple uh, Judy, Jewish text to to talk about um, specifically the the events that we know from Sinai from like Exodus nineteen when they arrive and you know through you know through twenty five when when Moses ascends and things like that actually all the way through like thirty two I think um, where where the the text implies some stuff that's kind of like clearly something otherworldly is happening with the fire and there's the sound of the trumpet like who's blowing the trumpets well so they insert it becomes pretty standard to just assume that what's going on is there's a lot of angels involved in actually imparting the torah like uh jubilees um jubilees 2 is a is a pretty easy one so, um, and the uh, Jubilees chapter two, verse one says, and the angel of the presence spoke to Moses by the word of the Lord saying, write the whole account of creation that in six days, the Lord God completed all of his works and all that he created. And he observed a Sabbath, the seventh day, and he sanctified it for all ages. And he set it as a sign for all his works. So this is where you get, you know, something that, it's kind of one of the beginning points of discussing Moses having received the revelation of the Torah through an angel or angels. Yeah, I mean, you get this referenced a bit in the New Testament as well, right? In passages like Galatians 3, if you're familiar with that, it says that Paul wrote that the law was put in place through angels, Galatians 3.19. Right. Um, you get a, another reference in Hebrews 2 as well, that the message was declared by angels. Uh, and then again in Acts 7. Um, you who receive the law as delivered by angels, as Stephen says in Acts 7. So, you know, like you said, Bill, it kind of becomes standard narrative that angels visited Moses yeah. on Mount Sinai. And then it gets elaborated upon, as you said, here in Jubilees, but also upon in Enoch and in Baruch as well. Yeah. Yeah, right. And because it really becomes kind of like standard in the the way that they th- reflect on the story. And there's reasons for that, but it, it becomes kind of just the way it is. Um, like uh, you also have like in the Septuagint, and the Septuagint isn't really aiming to elaborate and expand on the story a lot. It's just what they assume is going on. So like yeah. <clears throat> you might be familiar with the... Um, uh, the the Hebrew text basically says uh, uh, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, the Lord came from Sinai. He revealed himself to Israel from Seir, and he came forth. Uh, he appeared in splendor from Mount Paran. He came forth with ten thousands of his holy ones. With his right hand, he gave the, a fiery law to them. Well, this, this becomes in, uh, you know, from with his right hand, he gave the fiery law to them, becomes in the Septuagint. So you have, he had 10,000 of his holy ones with him. And then it says, and and on his right hand were angels coming with him. And so, and so it's, 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 it really deeply embedded in, in Jewish tradition, especially during the second temple period, that angels were involved with, you know, uh, with with the revelation at Sinai, and of course, angels involve the giving of revelation, and a lot of apocalyptic tradition moves around that. 
Yeah, most of the apocalyptic literature has uh, Jewish literature at the time uh, in the late Second Temple period has angels as the mediators of divine revelation. And so this gets projected back onto the historical narrative that angels are involved with Adam, angels are involved, you know, with Noah, angels are involved with Abraham, with Jacob, and with Moses. And of course, it's it's easy at Mount Sinai because, you know, surely there's more going on at Sinai than just God and human beings. You know, there's, there's probably right. angels <laughs> uh, floating. There's a lot going on unseen anyway. So it's a, it's a prime uh, event in the historical narrative in the, in the Torah to kind of read angelic activity back into angelic encounters. Yeah, totally makes sense. And, and even I remember when they were when uh, in the in the late seventies and early eighties when they were attempting to come up with a definition of things that defined apocalyptic literature, like that was actually one of the th- elements. Yeah, one right? of the main like, elements, right? Yeah. yeah, one of the one of the primary elements that defined a lot of the literatures that Revelation was given by uh, by means of angels, and uh, <clears throat> so you have. Really, it it kind of in in a way it becomes a way. Starting with jubilees, which I just read a minute ago, it becomes a way to invoke a sense of authority about the revelation given. Because if an angel gave it, and, and we would kind of see it the same way. Like if I got if I got like a little impression from the Lord in my quiet time, I I put it in a different category. If an angel walked up to me and told me something, right? Yeah, that reminds me of Luke 1 and Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, when oh, right, yeah. it's his course to minister in the temple, and he goes in and he sees an angel to the right side of the altar of incense, and then he comes out mute, and the people are like, oh my gosh, he's been in there a while, and then he comes out and he can't talk. Ooh, he must have seen an angel in there. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, and it's not that much different as in the charismatic movement today. Everybody sees angels right. to, to reinforce their understanding of the scriptures and their revelation that they have or whatever. People not involved in charismatic movement don't appreciate, uh, but it's it's not right. totally uncommon to human beings. It doesn't mean that everybody that's involved in the charismatic movement on some level appreciates Right, this. no. no that, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> exactly. Yeah. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay, we're digressing okay. big time. That's okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, uh, another another reference... Um, this is a little bit more obscure, but in the that they found in the Qumran caves in uh, Cave Four, uh, it's uh, it's four Q three seven seven, which if you know the the way they number the caves, it's a little bit funny. But uh, this is known as the Apocryphon to the Pentateuch, and um, so but it says, uh, but Moses. This is from the second fragment from that document, but Moses, the man of God, was with God in the cloud, and the cloud covered him because when he sanctified him, there's a little gap there in the fragment, and when he sanctified him and spoke as an angel through his mouth, for who was a messenger like him? So this is a little bit of an alternate view that actually the Lord kind of enabled Moses as an angel to speak to to Israel, but but the idea is that angels essentially give authority and credibility to what's being said. So we look back at Sinai, and since angels were involved, it's, it's, a, it's something we should really consider. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So even with that, I think we can look at some other Second Temple literature and see how if angels are giving credibility and authority to a message being spoken, we can see how angels even reveal the New Jerusalem and reveal the future, Israel's eschatological future, right? And a passage I think of around this is 2 Baruch chapter 4. Right. And in 2 Baruch 4, this really is a bit of a backdrop to this is Exodus 25 and the building of the tabernacle and uh, the pattern revealed on Mount Sinai. So this is 2 Baruch 4. After these things, I showed it, the, or showed the New Jerusalem to my servant Abraham in the night between the portions of the victims. And again, I showed it to Moses on Mount Sinai when I showed him the likeness of the tabernacle and all its vessels. 
Behold, now it is preserved with me as also paradise. And I think we've probably mentioned this passage before, but the point being that Moses was seeing the new Jerusalem when he was at the top of Sinai, and he was revealed what was revealed to him in passages like Exodus 25 when he was seeing the pattern that was being shown to him of the tabernacle and these things, that God was showing him the future, the new Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah, and then in some of the, in some cases, uh, so you have kind of the projecting forward of Jerusalem, and and like in that passage, in some cases, Sinai itself is actually projected forward into the future. Like um, this is Second Baruch fifty nine. This is a larger reference here, but uh, uh, Second Baruch fifty nine, starting in verse one, it says, "And the fourth bright waters." And you'll have to read the rest of the context to understand the the light and dark waters that were going on and what it meant. It was kind of a retelling of history this way. The fourth bright waters, which you've seen, that is the coming of Moses and of Aaron and of Miriam and Joshua, the son of Nun and of Caleb, and all those who are like these. For at that time... The lamp of the eternal law, which exists forever and ever, illuminated all those who sat in darkness. And this lamp will announce to those, so the, the, the lamp of the eternal law, and this lamp will announce to those who believe the promise of their reward and to those who deny the punishment of the fire which is kept for them. So it's a testimony to both the righteous and the wicked. And But also the heaven will be shaken from its place at that time. That is the heavens which under the throne of the mighty ones were shaken, were severely shaken when, when he took Moses with him. Mm. So referencing Sinai and the idea is that he actually raptured Moses up. <clears throat> and so Moses actually had this kind of experience in heaven with him. And now I'm in verse 4, for he showed him many warnings together with the ways of the law and the end of time. I think we read this one recently, didn't we? Last, Yeah, last episode. Mm -hmm. And the end of time, as also to you, and then further also the likeness of Zion with its measurements, which was to be made after the likeness of the present sanctuary. But he also showed him at that time the measure of fire. The, oh, that's right. I remember I read this, the depths of the abyss, the weight of the winds. He showed him lots of stuff. Yeah. And the uh, and the height of the air, the greatness of paradise, the end of the periods, the beginning of the day of judgment. I kind of skipped ahead to verse eight, um, and then in verse nine, the number of offerings, the worlds which have not yet come, the mouth of hell, the standing place of vengeance, the place of faith, the region of hope, the picture of the coming punishment, the multitude of the angels which cannot be counted the powers of the flame, the splendor of lightnings, the voice of thunders, the order of the archangels, the treasuries of the light, the changings of the time, the inquiries of the law. These are the fourth bright waters that you've seen. So that's a lot. What's going on here is the, it's a lot of stuff. And and I think it's meant to be like a summary statement of all the things that, that was shown to Moses at that time versus just like a list. But, but so it's, so you have, you know, the same thing similar to last week where Moses is kind of taken up and he's shown these things and Sinai gets projected into the future in that, but also the heaven will be shaken from its place at that time. That is the heavens, which are under the throne of the mighty one, which were severely shaken when he took Moses. And so the idea is the shaking of Sinai is going to happen again. And so the, even the context of Revelation there of Sinai is the heavens that were shaken when Sinai, when Sinai was shaken. That will happen again before the revelation of the Day of Judgment and those things happen. Yeah. So another really, really fascinating text. And yeah. this is, I think this is a great example of reading back into an event in, in the Torah a whole lot of stuff that gets revealed later on. And so, it, yeah. you know, for us, it's almost like because we're conditioned in historical context, you know, historical grammatical method since, totally. you know, since the totally. Reformation and, and particularly in the last century, 
uh, we view this as like deceitful. Like this is this is lying. <laughs> this is right. something is off here. But in reality, uh, we all do. All modern theology does the same thing when they come to the historical text. They read later revelation into the the earlier revelation, and they read the earlier revelation according to how they read the narrative as a whole. And so what ends up happening now in modern theology is basically realized eschatology and and supersessionism becomes the lens through which we read into Abraham and Moses and Sinai and these events that ultimately they don't really matter. Ultimately, they're they're insignificant that's because right. they're all just a backdrop to the real story that's going on in Jesus, and he's fixing the earth now, and he's taking it over through the church, and he's whatever, whatever, however you, whatever narrative you want to read, but, the, you know, some kind of spiritualized, universalized narrative becomes the filter by which we read over the the Torah anyway. So really, they're just doing the same thing, only they're reading an apocalyptic narrative over, you know, back into the, the, the earlier revelation. Right. That's a, that's a really good point. That's a good way of thinking about it, because it's not, it isn't any different. So the, the apocalyptic writers are essentially doing what they see to be a benefit to their contemporary audience. Like if, if, you know, this is really how they need to anchor their hope and not lose heart. And so we're going to basically look back and go, look, this is, this is what Moses and Abraham were thinking about the whole time. And, and this was what Adam was probably thinking. And, and so it is, it's very similar to what people do now. It's just, we've, we've kind of been conditioned to read it differently, but it's, so it's after the period of the prophets. And so you have that lens of the prophetic, even especially the later prophetic material, like in Isaiah or Ezekiel or like, um, like in Zechariah, that later material basically frames how they're viewing where things are at going forward. But they don't see that as something that was like, totally disconnected from the Torah, even if it wasn't understood fully. So they're just putting it back there as a way to kind of, it was really a pastoral thing that they're doing to try to help people not lose heart and understand what God was actually doing in their generation and and what he was going to do in the future. Right. And, you know, we're so conditioned to, you know, authorial intent and the the truth and reality of of things empirically and objectively that we get hung up that you know Enoch and Baruch and and Moses and Abraham didn't actually have these revelations therefore they're not true they're fake they're whatever and they, they write them off but uh, but that just wasn't how they you know that wasn't how they approached it they didn't no. think of it that way in the and maybe there was some charismatic guys that were having experiences like this that were then presenting those experiences through kind of right. revered prophets in the past or maybe you know they just had dreams about them we do the same thing with with uh, with Bunyan and Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress or whatever, yeah, right. Right. How, however, <laughs> however you want to frame the the revelation or the understanding that then gets projected onto the biblical text, it wasn't something nefarious that was going on at the time, and it was edifying to believers, to believing Jews at the time. Uh, uh, they they viewed it as inspirational. It was spread and copied and translated throughout the diaspora, and so uh, it it uh, it's not something that needs to have an, a negative attitude or bias against yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, those are great thoughts, and and I think it's so important to see it this way that we see that this is what the Second Temple authors, the New Testament, is doing. That it's taking these events from the Tanakh, projecting them forward, because yeah, I mean. Like you said, Bill, they need to encourage people to persevere and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And one other thing that comes to mind, Josh, you know, uh, is the centrality of dreams and angels when you get to the New Testament. Mm, yeah. Right? That a lot of this conditions when the angel appears to Joseph in dreams, appears to Mary and says, 
you will have a child. He'll be called the son of the most high and God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will rule over his kingdom forever. So the very, the, 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 the event of an angel appearing and speaking these things and confirming eschatological themes is conditioned in the Jewish mind already. Right. And yep, so absolutely. it's not like that, you know, that they have a dream, they have a vision, and an angel appears. Oh, this must be that. No, this confirms that. Absolutely. Right. And so there's a common association. And the magnificent after that, Mary's response yeah. essentially reflects all that she understood from the the angel's message, exactly, which is about eschatological themes related to the day of the Lord yep. and the Lord subduing right. all the enemies of Israel. Yep. And so it's, it's essentially what she's deriving from it, even beyond what the angel actually said. It totally corresponds to that. So they are conditioned already to understand what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah guys, it's great. That's great. I think looking at our last theme here, uh, in this episode, all, with all of this in mind, relating to Sinai and Moses again, as we're saying, this is projected eschatologically. Where is this going? And I think we can see, like in a passage in First Enoch, where uh, angels are revealed at Mount Sinai because the angels will be returning to Mount Sinai with fire at the Day of Judgment. Yeah, so in First Enoch 1, you know, the 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 parable or revelation that's given to Enoch is introduced as Enoch says, the God of the universe, the Holy Great One, will come forth from his dwelling, and from there he will march upon Mount Sinai and appear in his camp, emerging from heaven with a mighty power. And everyone shall be afraid, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Mountains and high places will fall down and be frightened, and high hills shall be made low, and they shall melt like a honeycomb before the flame. So you get kind of the, the references to the prophetic literature in Isaiah there, and, and the Isaiah 40, the leveling of, of mountains, etc. And the earth shall be rent asunder, you know, Isaiah 20, uh, 24, and all that's upon the earth shall perish. There shall be judgment upon on all, including the righteous, and to all the righteous, he will grant peace. He will preserve the elect, and kindness shall be upon them. And they shall all belong to God, and they shall prosper, be blessed, and the light of God shall shine upon them. Behold, he will arrive with ten million of his holy ones in order to execute judgment upon all. He will destroy the wicked ones, censure all flesh on account of everything they've done, that which the sinners and the wicked ones committed against him. So, of course, this is quoted by Jude in light of the return of Jesus in the day of the Lord. And But all of that is uh, uh, assumed around Sinai as the locus of that event because, right. you know, Sinai is, um, is a, a, a climactic kind of revelation of God and he comes with angels and that's how the day of God is going to be. That's what's coming in the future. So it's kind of a, a pattering... Yeah. Uh, patterning like the flood is of divine judgment. It's a patterning of divine revelation and, and uh, theophany. Yeah. Well, we've got a friend, Joel Richardson. Many of you are probably familiar with him. We've had him on our show before in season two. We interviewed him, but he's got a whole book on this theme. Uh, it's called From Sinai to Zion, where he lays out this entire pattern and how Sinai is projected eschatologically and how the prophets and Second Temple literature and the New Testament point forward towards this day when God is going to come with 10,000 of his holy ones as he did at Mount mm -hmm. Sinai. So th this is this interests you. Joel has an entire book on this called From Sinai to Zion. We'll put a link to it in the show notes to this episode. Yeah, it is. It is interesting that Sinai, in a lot of in a lot of literature, Sinai becomes it kind of it's been, you know later on after after Zion and and uh, Jerusalem are a thing after the period of David, then then Sinai and Zion kind of take on dual roles in in uh, in in revelatory, but also in 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 the in the redemptive narrative, like Joel points out, points out in the book, but. One passage that uh, that is really sweet that I like how it illustrates is the connection is Jubilees four uh, verse twenty six. We started reading Jubilees one, 
just to illustrate the connection of the angel that visited um, Moses on Sinai as an example of like this is this is was kind of a became a normal normal thing to to see to look back into the scripture was that angels had appeared and either ca- either Moses was caught up and 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 heard the things or he was on the mountain and angels were sent down whatever but <clears throat> Jubilees 4 says for the Lord has four sacred places upon the earth uh, the garden of eden and the mountain of the east and this mountain which you're on today mount zion or mount I'm sorry mount sinai and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation for the sanctification of the earth. So That's these awesome. places will be sanctified in the new creation for the sake of the sanctification of the whole planet. And on account of this, the earth will be sanctified from all sin and from pollution throughout eternal generations. So basically, wow. the, the, the sanctification of these locations in the age to come, according to, you know, Jubilees, is actually going to be, it, which is not, which is very normal to not just Second Temple literature, but ancient Near East, and well, actually all around the world, like all ancient temples were on mountains, mm-hmm. all of them, which is why you have references to high places and things like that. Even pagan worship places were on the high places of Israel. And so that that these sacred places that he has are are uh, are the ideas that they're high places and that they will be sanctified. And from there, the idea is that he's going to sanctify the earth in the new creation or in the age to come. I think that's a pretty sweet passage too. Yeah, yeah I think it's the the idea of divine theophany or appearance. You know, is really highlighted at Sinai, and then yeah. Uh, a lot of the Day of the Lord or Day of Yahweh references that later develop in the prophetic literature are kind of uh, based on the idea of Sinai and God appearing, and God's going to appear again in in complete and absolute right. glory. Yeah. And the same thing that that happened at Sinai with the 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 dark cloud, you know, impending judgment ideas the. The trumpet sounding, the shaking of the mountain, all of these get repeated later, you know, in reference to the day of the Lord, because you have the the kind of greater divine appearance that, that happens at that time. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point to mention. The point of sanctification of those sacred spaces is for the mm-hmm. Lord's presence there. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. I think, you know, another passage that just comes to mind as we finish up our episode today relating to this theophany, a messianic theophany, kind of visions of God and, and related to the day of God uh, and connected to Sinai is the Mount of Transfiguration, right? You get God at the top of a mountain and it's shaking and there's a cloud and Peter and James and John are all scared and Moses is there too, right? So you get you get this theophanic connection with Sinai and the revelation, especially in light of what's spoken. This is my beloved son, listen to him and then you know, how this is played out in Second Peter 1, where Peter, and we've talked about this before, and actually just recently one of our Q&A episodes, where Peter develops this idea where he says, we saw him on the holy mountain, calls it the holy mountain again, obviously connecting it back to Sinai uh, and, and the idea of it being a theophany. But he says, we have the words of the prophets made more certain or made more sure. And so he sees the messianic theophany at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration as a confirmation of the eschatological hope of the Jews, as we've talked about uh, oftentimes before. Yeah, that's good, which is which is probably a fair way to also communicate how how the sec- a lot of Second Temple writers were hoping their audience would hear it. Right. We now have the words of the prophets made more sure. Right. Because of the writing, and, yeah. and like like John said, not some sort of dubious, weird motive, right. but but that was kind of the intended response all along. So that's that's really good, right? Right, which is just mind blowing. How you know, and it's like what we do, what you said earlier in the episode, guys. How uh, we typically read realized eschatology into all of these things, and and to see that that's not what the Second Temple authors or the authors of the New Testament were doing with this specific 
instance from the Tanakh, specifically Sinai. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, they were seeing it eschatologically and apocalyptically. Yeah, and I think, you know, the following verses in Second Peter 1 are also indicative of how Jews interpreted the Scripture at the time of the New Testament. So Peter goes on saying, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the assumption is, is that they're all being carried along in the same direction by the Holy Spirit, and that the covenant frames how the being carried along happens. And so there's not an option for some radically new revelation that contradicts or changes the covenant and the previous trajectory of revelation that's happening, right? And so everyone's being carried along as time moves forward by the same Spirit of God, and they're given progressive revelation of the same realities headed in the same direction toward the same conclusion, right? And so as these things are happening and the Mount of Transfiguration is not some sort of spiritualization or realization, you know, some sort of fulfillment out of line of of what Jews are expecting at the time, but it's a confirmation of what Jews are already expecting. And so this is how they're 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 viewing God being active in the world in this age is that God's confirming what he's going to do at the end climactically. Yeah. Amen, guys. Well, listeners, we hope that this has been edifying and encouraging. We want to continue our walk through the Tanakh next week, so we hope you join us. Until then, God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 